Good evening. Welcome to another edition of the Shadow Trader Video Weekly for Sunday, August 23rd, 2020. If you recall, the title of last week's video was A Few Things for Longs to Think About. And this week's title is more of the same. It's a few more things for longs to think about because this particular week in the markets played out very similarly to last week where all we had was this slow incremental grind higher. We tested the all time high this week, double top there on Friday. And yet the underpinnings continue to be extremely weak. When I show you what the market internals look like on Friday, uh, trading day which just ended actually I'm recording this on a Friday you will see that it was some of the greatest divergence we've ever seen it was absolutely unprecedented some of the reads that I saw coming out from the exchange level versus what the market was doing so we're gonna break that down a little bit we're gonna talk about components of the S&P 500 and sector weighting in the S&P 500 as well and we're gonna just show how this rally is just very very narrow I'm also gonna get a little bit into market profile I'm just gonna show you two key nuances that I think are important that are kind of short-term uh, bearish indicators or at the very least going hand in hand with everything I've been saying that the the rally just doesn't feel that strong uh, under the hood All right last but not least we are going to do a trade of the week this week from the weekly options advisory I think you'll enjoy it it's actually a double shot it's a back-to-back -back trade that I did I call that rinse and repeat and it is a unbalanced butterfly in the S&P, a trade that I like to put on for zero or five cents or 25 cents, and then flip it out for 50 cents, 75 cents, a dollar, three dollars. I'll show you how that's done and I'll give you some tips and tricks as well on how to effectuate that trade yourself. Without further ado, let's get into it. So as I was saying in the introduction, let's just assume that this video picks up right where last week left off because we're kind of in the same exact spot in terms of market internals under the hood being weak. So I thought we'd start here with the, the traditional quad screen that we use here in Shadow Trader with the um, breadth in the uh, upper left. This is uh, Vol D, the relationship between volume flowing into up stocks and down stocks. We'll get into the details of that in a moment. Uh, advancers versus decliners. Um, it's uh, advancers minus decliners. Uh, ticks, which is self-explanatory. Every time a stock uh, prints a price higher than the prior price, that's an uptick. If it's down, it's a down tick. Cumulative tick adds up all those uh, ticks during the course of the day, and then we plot it with a histogram. And then we keep our uh, S&P over here. So this is a snapshot from Friday afternoon after the close. And in looking at a market minder window here on another screen, uh, S&P was up 11. NASDAQ 100 is up 78. Uh, Russell was down, actually, which is interesting because I do think of the Russell as, as somewhat of a risk on, risk off barometer. Um, and NASDAQ uh, composite was up about a half of 1%, and Dow was up a little more than that, about two thirds. And we also know that the SP closed right at all time highs, correct? Or almost. It backed off a little bit, uh, in actually, almost, actually, very, very close to it, right? If you can see it clear here on the daily pretty much like right at it. Uh, it was actually a new high because we had 339954 and this is 339996. So basically just like right at a new high. And the whole point of all of this is just to show how pursuant to last week's um, discussion, the rally is very narrow and it's just going up a little bit on a few stocks and a couple of sectors. I'm gonna show you that in a second. But look at the breadth here. It's actually two to one negative overall. And this is measured at the exchange level, which is a much broader market level. And in order for rallies to sustain, you really need broad participation. Two to one negative. NASDAQ, which showed a little bit of relative strength, was only one and a half to one negative. Advancers were losing to decliners by a margin of minus 990. Notice that this number never got anywhere close to the zero line and got positive. All right. Tick distribution. We measure very, very simple stupid by just seeing how many 15 minute candles close above zero versus below zero. Very simple, but it works. Notice that the tick distribution is firmly negative. There's a lot more candles closing underneath zero than there are above zero. And more importantly, the cumulative tick, which I think is a fantastic indicator, this is a pretty solid number to the downside. This is not the type of number you would expect to see on a day when the S&P is closing at a record high. It's just not. You would not expect a minus 4,000 cumulative tick. And look at the build. I call this the build if it builds from one side to the other, like upper left, lower right, or on a bullish day, lower left, upper right. On this day, the ticks specifically had a very obvious build, right, from the uh, 
upper left down to the lower right. And that's something that's more typical of a trending day to the downside, to be honest with you. I mean, this is really just the, the amount of divergence here is absolutely staggering. So you may just ask yourself, well, why is this all happening or where is it all coming from? And it, it's, it's really stemming from the fact that there's a, a couple of stocks, internet stocks especially, but especially Apple, which I'm going to show you in a second, that are just super duper um, strong right now. So this right here is straight from the S&P Global website. This is straight from the S&P 500 website. Um, and this is showing you the top 10 constituents by index weight of the S&P 500. And Apple is number one. And I believe the weight of this is about 6% of the whole, whole, um, whole index. And if you go down a little further, look at what the, S the top 10 stocks in the S&P all are. Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, two Googles. Mind you, these are two separate stocks. So you have the capitalization of this stock and the capitalization of this stock. It's like Google gets two entries in the S&P 500. That's why the S&P 500 actually has 505 stocks in it right now and not 500. All right, but that also weighs on this, okay? Then you get into healthcare, which is J&J. &J. And if you look here in the uh, sector breakdown, healthcare is the second heaviest weighted sector in the S&P after information technology, which is obviously names we just looked at, such as Facebook, uh, Microsoft, and Apple. So when you have this huge portion made up by essentially just two sectors, and if those sectors are rallying, then it doesn't take much to bring the market uh, forward. For instance, on this Friday, the S&P was only up 0.34 because I believe that, you know, across the board, it wasn't all that strong. But look at what Apple did over the course of the day. The, the biggest stock in the S&P 500, it was actually up 5.15% on Friday. And again, as I was saying, the S&P was up a third of 1%. Okay, so this is really, really important. The other thing I wanted to show you is this is how the S&P can um, move higher even when it's only a few stocks. I just showed you that the healthcare stocks were number two on the sectors. Well, look at the reversal here. Now, the healthcare stocks didn't really close with any major gain, obviously, because they closed kind of flat if you look at the two candles between Friday and Thursday. But look at the rally that was staged off the lows, pretty strong. And that's what happens, basically. You have a sector that's number two weight in the S&P, and it really gets going, moves, moves pretty good off the lows, and it's going to keep that S&P higher. And all of this that I'm showing you is essentially translating into this activity that we're seeing. Is the market just basically slowly just grinding, grinding higher and feeling very tired? No real big body candles anywhere here. It's been a long time since we had range expansion. Like range expansion is this. These are called follow through days. This is range expansion. And usually after range expansion, you get further moves up. It doesn't have to happen the next day. It can be choppy. It doesn't matter. But you get range expansion that kind of sets the tone. And then from there in, you move up. You have range expansion here, sets the tone, move up. Range expansion here, kind of sets the tone. You move up a little, you fall back, but you come to a higher low, and again, you get range expansion, and you go up. We've had no range expansion for some time in, in the S&P. And again, this is why, because you have this constant small rally that's just being driven by a small handful of stocks and a couple of sectors, and it's not really broad. So these are data points that we really need to be carrying forward, especially you know these market internals that I keep showing how weak they are because I think it's absolutely unprecedented. I actually haven't seen this in a long time. The cumulative tick especially, as I was saying, is something I, I really put a lot of stock into. I use it constantly uh, and yet negative. I mean, looking like you know when, when measured broadly against the whole New York Stock Exchange, really kind of looking more like a, a trending day to the downside. All right, let's take a quick look at market profile see what that's showing us. Obviously a more or less uh, continuation of, of the same thing, or I should say confirmation. A couple of nuances here that are important to take into next week. 
big poor high and poor high at a prior high. So you could actually bring these profiles together and you would have a huge lack of excess here as the top of these three ranges would all be the same. And remember, a poor high looks like this on the top. All right, there's your distribution. And the poor high is like the flat top. All right, it's like the flat top. So if you remember, Big Daddy Kane said the flat top rules in 89, but the flat top doesn't rule in market profile in 2020 because the flat top in the market profile uh, really indicates that buyers are kind of stuck at bad prices. They have bad location. And we know that because there's a good amount of value here. There's plenty of time spent, but they didn't get what they were looking for. They didn't get that excess high that they could sell into. All right, last week I showed you a situation where the point of control didn't migrate higher with price. We saw that again Friday, didn't migrate higher, price closed up higher here. We did build up a little bit of value here later in the day, which is good. But again, I do take note of these, these POCs, which are the fairest price to do business, not migrating higher, okay? Next, we have continued value overlapping. This is also not a bullish sign. In the yellow boxes is where roughly 70% of the day's volume, we talked about this last week, excuse me, about the, uh, you know, the one standard deviation on each side, the bell curve, the distribution, et cetera. Roughly 70% of the volume falls on one standard deviation on either side of the mean. And that's the yellow uh, markings here showing you where that 70%, we call that the value area in market profile. Um, it's not bullish when it's overlapping. It's more bullish when it's like clean and breakaway to the upside. So you basically have here four day balance area, again, four day balance area, this like small body, which is kind of meaningless. You know, here you have a little bit of breakaway value to the upside. Here, overlapping again, right? So you see what I'm saying, how far back you have to go? Here's some unfilled gaps. This is also bad structure that is definitely gonna get filled in at some point. These are all targets that you wanna be looking at if and when the market finally gives it up and it has one of those down days that actually has follow through where the breadth is like 12 to one negative and the advanced decline line is minus 2,500 and it's pegged. Those are the signals that you're getting a trending day and you can pretty much short any bounce. On that type of day, these are the areas that you're, that you're gonna to wanna to be targeting. You're gonna to wanna to be looking at 3,300 at the bottom of this gap. You're gonna to wanna to be looking at this virgin point of control. And I have to actually uh, request ticks here because it's actually a different, not sure why it's showing up here. It's actually should be a little bit higher uh, up here, but regardless, virgin point of control in this area, another gap here, right? There was a larger balance area here, bottom of gap here, 3267. These are all the areas that you're gonna be looking at if we were to see some sort of a uh, move lower. So keep that in mind. Main takeaways here, again, like I was saying, just to recap, poor high is short-term bearish. I would not be surprised if we back off a bit on Sunday night. Usually prices back away from the poor high first, and then they go back to the poor high to repair the poor high, and also value continually overlapping. Last thing I will say on the profile is this, and this is actually a short-term, or a slightly longer term, I should say, bullish signal, in that rallies generally don't end like this. They don't generally end on poor structure on a poor high, they end with a bang instead of a whimper and they will have an excess high. So the distribution will look more like this and it'll have the big excess high on top and we don't have that. But these types of things can take a long time to resolve themselves. We can leave that poor structure on the profile for quite a while, meaning that, you know, I'm not saying that we're gonna get a sell off next week, but I'm saying, let's say there was one, you could have a sell off that could last a couple of weeks and then you carry forward the fact that there was no excess high in the profile at the top and then the market turns around and starts going up again maybe it gives you the confidence to start buying those lows remembering hmm you know we never got that blow off top we never got that excess maybe this is it maybe you know maybe now we're gonna charge back there uh, and do it okay let's get into the trade of the week it's actually two trades this week because they're basically the same trade, something that I call rinse repeat. Rinse repeat is when you basically do the same trade or same, same style of trade in the same index or stock week after week, or even in the case of the S&P, a uh, few times a week because the SPX has expiries of Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. 
and did this trade twice with my subscribers on August 14th and getting out on August 17th and then did it again on this uh, Thursday, August 20th, getting out on the 21st. And what's interesting about this, if you notice, is the huge disparity between what was paid for the trade. So we'll start with the first one on 423 or number 423, this was last week on Friday. Uh, this was actually the Friday to Monday trade. Bought a unbalanced butterfly, 132, and I'll get into that in a second on the platform showing you how that is, with long strike at 3385, then short three options at 3400, and then buying two options at 3415 and paid a 25 cent debit for it. And notice that on Monday, unwinding it, sold half of it for a dollar and the other half for three dollars which is quite a huge uh, risk to reward if you think about it uh, buying something for 25 cents and selling it for three dollars and then in the spirit of what i call rinse repeat did it again on thursday friday of just this week this one was bought for just a nickel debit uh slightly different strikes but exact same methodology in this case just moving up in strikes a little bit if you notice this one was uh, structured with the 3400 strike in the middle. This one was structured with the 3420 strike in the middle and the third strike a little bit further out. All right, so this one actually is an unbalanced butterfly. This one is an unbalanced broken wing butterfly. Broken wing butterflies when there is not equal distance between the strikes. This one uh, was not as dramatic because we didn't move up close enough to the strikes, but the expansion of the price was pretty dramatic very quickly in that this one was put on on Thursday for a nickel debit. And on that same day on Thursday, just a couple of hours later, the spread expanded to a 55 cent credit, which is 10 times what was paid in the span of just I think it was less than two hours, which is pretty impressive. So let's take a quick look at uh, what I do in this trade in the SPX. And this is a trade that I do pretty often with uh, my weekly options uh, subscribers. And I'm just going to give you a few tips and tricks on when to use this trade and how it works. So first of all, why is this trade working right now? Well, this trade works on a couple of different um, dynamics, so to speak, what like makes the trade work. First thing you need is you need short duration. Do not attempt to do any one, three, two with any time frame. I would say longer than two or three days maximum. The sweet spot I think is really to put it on on say a Tuesday and look to take it off on a Wednesday or put it on a Friday to Monday or whatever. Sometimes it can be done on the same day depending on the, how the market is acting. So that is the first thing. Secondly, you wanna look at an index or stock that you have a very good and strong conviction that you will be going to a resistance point but not breaking out through it. So certainly over the course of these last two trades, the S&P fit that description because I know that it's just grinding higher. And that slow grind in one direction is excellent when you're long one option and then your short three options a little higher and then your long two options, which are really like the garbage calls that don't really mean anything, they're just there for margin, you're long those two options further on. So it's really this structure that's the driver of the trade. So think about it. If you put something on here with this structure and the market just slowly does this and it crawls up to your long strike and maybe it gets up to your short strike or maybe it just dies right here or maybe it just makes it just up to your long strike and it dies. Well, this is going to expand greatly in terms of the price that you paid. You may have paid five cents at the time because at the time there was a good amount of value right here. You wanna set up a situation where you're selling the mid strikes for at least a dollar or more. Okay, this is an important tip. You don't wanna be in this trade in a situation where you, for instance, do like a plus one and this one is worth like 90 cents or something, right? And this one is 30 cents. So you're doing like minus three here, right? And then plus two, this one is five cents and this equals how much? This equals 10 cents, right? Because you paid 90 cents for this one. You sold three of these at 30 cents. So you got you all that 90 cent back and then you paid a nickel for two of these, which equals 10 cents. This is not a good trade, all right? Understand, it's not a good trade at all because it's never gonna expand for you unless you get big delta direction, you can call that, going up 
through your long strike or at least to it and into your short strike. You want to set up these trades on the short term where you have the middle strike, like I said, being at least the dollar of credit, if not more, and in thereby you are leveraging the power of selling multiple units of those expensive options that are a dollar or more. And that way, even if the stock goes nowhere, if it's just flat, the spread should expand in value just by nature of time. And that's how we were able to turn a nickel into 55 cents on that first day. The market did rally a tiny bit, but really not much. And But what it was, was that passage of time really helped out. It was just, you know, time is good, kind of late on one day, going into the next day is just basically how it works. So this is basically how I do one, three, twos, um, rather one, three, twos, and they are called, uh, as I was saying, they are called unbalanced uh, butterflies. And for instance, I'll just show you real quick on the Thinkorswim platform if you want to effectuate such a trade like this or just play around with different strikes and see how it works, you can just go down here let's say you're on the call side you just go like this you go buy unbalanced butterfly and that automatically puts up the structure of the 132 like this and then you want to just adjust your strikes accordingly obviously you don't want to be too narrow that's another thing about the 132 i will mention just in closing is that being very very narrow like this like only five points wide that's just going to result in a big credit trade but it will be nearly impossible for you to make money with that on any sort of a directional basis and if price does start to creep towards your spread you will probably get hurt very badly all right so that is basically my short-term overview or my quick overview on how i do uh, unbalanced butterfly trades uh, with my weekly options subscribers. Uh, if you'd like to join us, you can just hit that link uh, right there that you see on the screen, www.shadowtrader.net forward slash options. And that is all for this week. Thank you as always for spending just a little bit of your weekend with me. Big announcement. If you are watching this video from outside of North America, and I've gotten so many emails from people asking me, when are international clientele going to be able to sign up for options advisories, right? Because they're all via text message. And up until now, we have not been able to text outside of US or Canada. Well, this right here, you probably can't see it up close. It doesn't matter. It is the app called Viber, V-I-B-E-R. It's kind of like WhatsApp. Okay, this is where the texts are gonna come through. The reason I'm showing you this right here is because I actually ran a test with our texting provider this morning on Friday the 21st and some texts were sent to me and he was telling me that the developers were actually in the Ukraine and they were receiving Shadow Trader texts as well without issue. So the plan is we're gonna run some more tests early next week and hopefully by probably mid next week or end of next week, we're gonna be sending out an email to everybody who is on the shadowtrader.net email list saying that texting is now available outside of the United States and Canada. So we're very excited to offer these services globally now outside of uh, just North America and I hope you join us. All right, getting back to the technicals and the underpinnings and everything that we just talked about. Remember, in the introduction to the video of last week, which was part one of some things for longs to think about. If you recall, the first thing I said when I came on camera was, this is not a bearish video. This is not a bearish call. I need to reiterate that this week because now we're back to back with the same exact situation here in week two as we had in the prior week's video. And I have to say again, it is not a bearish call. Remember, the market can continue to grind higher as long as it wants. This poor structure can continue you know, this uh, bearish underpinnings can continue, but I believe that it can't continue forever. I do think that the narrowness of the rally here is somewhat of a danger. I think it does open the market up to some selling, but that is going to need a catalyst. And I'm not really sure what that catalyst is yet, uh, or at least it has not appeared on the horizon. But as we come into the more of the, you know, end of Q3, Q4, if you think about election year, it's probably gonna shake things up a bit. I mean, like I said, I don't know when it's coming, but it just feels like 
the stage is, is setting and it's coming uh, up to that, all right? Last but not least, I hope you enjoyed this week's trade of the week. These are the types of things that I put out every day to my weekly option subscribers, $49 a month. You can cancel any time. There is no contract. And you also get my Peter's Pre-Market Perspective morning report every day, which is the market profile analysis I showed you in the video. I analyze the market profile every single morning with key levels and scenarios for that particular day. If you sign up to either weekly options advisory or time spreads advisory run by my colleague, Scott Gillum, I throw in that Peter's Pre-Market Perspective report for free. All right, on behalf of myself and the entire Shadow Trader team here in beautiful Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, I wish you good trading and good night.